Hi, I'm Belinda Carley, the Director of the Institute of Personal Care Science, and today I'm going to show you how we colour match in the lab. And you'll see that you don't need fancy machines to get a great colour match. Now I'm going to show you with a real world example today. In this particular case, we have a product sample where a client has asked for a very non-specific, more red-brown colour to the sample we've already prepared, which as you can see in this jar is, is quite a dark brown colour to begin with. Now this particular product requires this very dark coloration for its performance purposes. It's a very specialised product we've created. But what I'm going to show you today is how to colour match to a more generalised description if you don't have a product to specifically colour match to. This is quite a common industry concept where you might be dealing with a market or concept developer, a brand manager, uh, and it happens a lot when preparing lipsticks. They might want a lipstick that's more pink or a lipstick that's more red. Now unfortunately with the colour spectrum, what is more red or more pink or in this case more red-brown to a client or a brand manager or a concept developer can mean one thing and there's so many colour variations in the colour spectrum that in this case you'll see we're going to actually send them a couple of different variations of what might be considered a red-brown so that they can then select and guide us further. It's especially helpful if you have a benchmark or comparison product. Again, in the case of lipsticks, this is very, very relevant. If someone says they want a bold red lipstick, what is their interpretation of bold red? So if they can't provide you with an actual sample of product, then ask for a Pantone color or something similar so that you have a red color to start with. So again, this is using some real world examples so that you can see how we do this sort of thing in the lab. Now when we scale up to larger batches, it's a completely different uh, scope. It's completely different machinery used, but I'm going to show you in small lab samples how we do this so that you can apply this same concept to your color developments as well. So what we start with is a plain base and as an example, this is the base product X colorant. So what we've done is we've prepared a larger amount of base product. This is so that we don't have to prepare base product for every color match we make. So we will take a certain portion, a certain percentage of this base product, and to that base product, we will create our color variants. Now I'm going to be using very basic lab equipment today because the actual process of colour matching is far more important for you to understand than at this small lab size worrying about fancy equipment. And what I'm going to show you today is you simply don't need the fancy equipment to still get an effective colour match. So I have measured out some of the base you saw a moment ago in this bowl. Now this is very specific, we have to be very specific with our measurements. We need to use three digit scales, so you'll need scales that measure in 0.001 gram resolution. This is so that you can be very specific with the amount of colorant you're adding and very specific with the amount of base you're using to make sure that your color can be reproduced in a larger scale. If you are not accurate by even 0.001 of a gram in a small lab sample like we're going to prepare, it will become very inaccurate by the time you scale up to 10 or 100 kilos of production batch. So you must make sure if you're color matching, you're using scales that measure in 0.001 gram increments to ensure your lab samples will then be translatable to larger batch samples. So with this, I'm now going to add some of our titanium dioxide, which we're using for opacity. I am then going to add uh, amounts of yellow colorant, red colorant, and black colorant. Now we're using iron oxides so that we can create uh, a matte brown effect with this product. So, 
It's not a foundation product, it's actually a colorant that is going to make the skin look browner in general. It is for dance and performing artists, so it is designed to be a very wear resistant and sweat resistant formula, which is why also you'll see the color is so intense. It's meant to be spread over large areas of the body. So again, today you're going to see very intense color matching and very intense color developed. I'm using this particular example because it's an extreme example of colour matching. In other colour matching videos, you'll see us use more subtle effects, but this is a great one for you to see what we do when we've got intense colours to match. So, to do this, I'm now going to use my three digit scales and to make sure I'm accurate, one of the things with these scales, you need to make sure there is no wind in the room. So even the use of air conditioning, can unbalance these scales as constant breeze on these uh, specific scales will cause the reading to fluctuate and you can't have that, you must be accurate. Even just leaning on the bench can affect these scales. So you'll see I'm very careful when I actually come to measure, I won't be talking because that breathing could affect the scales and I won't be moving greatly because that could affect the scales. You will see me measure from the colorants to a larger spoon and then you'll see me add that to the bowl and then I start to mix. So while I'm in this process, I won't be talking simply because that could impact my measurements. And the most important thing you need to do when you're color matching is be accurate. And you'll also see I have paperwork out to record what I actually do add because being accurate is fundamental to get your color match right. Okay, so this is how it looks so far. I'm now going to mix this. I'm just using a uh, spatula. I'm using the hard end of the spatula because in this case, I'm not using pre-milled pigments. Now, if I was doing this, uh, this is an oil-based product. It's actually got a lot of uh, silicon base in there. Uh, and because of that, the pigments are wetted easily. So the pigments, uh, are effectively getting incorporated into the base product without me needing to pre-grind them first. So I'll just mix these in a little and I can show you what I'm creating. So you can see how easy the colorants are to mix in to the base product using just the spatula. Now in this case, I'm doing, um, preparing a 10 gram sample. Now you might say, why are you preparing such a small sample? Well, at this stage, I'm just trying to create the color that the client is looking for. If I was to do this with 50 grams or even 100 grams of samples each time at this very early stage of development, I would go through a lot of product and a lot of colorant and I could run out of my raw materials very fast. So we start by doing just a 10 gram sample so that we are conserving materials because at this stage we are aiming to create the desired colour. We can easily upscale this to a 100 gram sample to check our accuracy once the client has approved the small version. And from there you would want to do some larger lab and pilot scale batches anyway. That's part of a quality development process. Now you need to make sure that you mix thoroughly. One thing you need when it comes to colour matching is a big dose of patience because it may take you three samples to get the colour right, it may take you ten, it may take you more. So again, this is why we start with very small samples 
and we start with our pre-prepared base because you will in reality be preparing multiple samples of product to get the colour just right. Now when you are mixing and colour matching, you need to make sure that you get every bit of colour incorporated. So as you can see here, there are bits of red pigment still not mixed in. Uh, this is over here. So for me, and if you're doing this in the workplace, you'd be able to see it perhaps better than it's come out on the video. But you would see that there's some pigment still left. So you've got to make sure every bit of colour is included in your sample before you can evaluate if it's achieved the colour required. Now you might also be thinking, how have I determined how much yellow, red and black I've added? Well, I have got this colour here as a reference point. You will see me prepare some colour match samples in other videos where I have another reference sample where I have unknown quantities of input. So I'll explain that in another colour video. In this particular colour video, I just want to walk you through the colour matching process in general and we can get into that detail in a future video. So now I'm happy that everything's combined. You will see I'm using fairly basic equipment. Again, if you have more advanced lab equipment, that's fine. But I really want you to see the process rather than focusing on the equipment. You'll see it's just as effective using this basic equipment once you understand the process. And the process is what I want to teach you today. So now we are ready to compare. So you need to make sure you are taking relatively the same amount of the benchmark product as you are of your comparison product, otherwise you will get a different visual effect. The other thing you need to do is make sure that you always apply across the arm. You need to apply this way just because you will find that the skin on this side of your arm will differ slightly in colour from this side of the arm. So if I was to apply product this way and compare it that side with that side, I could find some background colour just from the difference in my skin tone, which could throw off my ability to colour match. So what you should see is we were asked to create more of a red-brown. That was the original. And this is what we've just created. You can see it is quite subtle, but there is definitely more red in this version here. So what we'll do now is we're going to add the mica component. We're going to add the mica component to make sure that what we've got in this bowl is 100%. When you're colour matching, you start with a base that is missing colourant and undetermined mica or other powder content to equal 100%. So now that we have a known amount of base and a known amount of colour, we now need to calculate the missing powder quantity and add the amount of mica required to bring the total product to 100%. Okay, so now we're continuing on. We started with a product that was requested to be more red-brown. We then created our sample, we've made sure it equals 100%. I've then packed that off into a small sample which will be sent to the client for their evaluation. And I'm keeping a very small retention sample for us for comparison purposes. And again, I've still got the actual colour result on my arm because now I'm going to prepare another sample that's even more red-brown again for the client to evaluate and compare to let me know which they prefer. Now this is a good way of working with colour matching so that you can get a preference uh, or a, a, a lean towards one sample or the other. Now best case scenario one of those samples will be approved and we can finalise the formulation. If not, we at least have two comparison samples sent so they can then say I want it to be a little bit more like this first one 
but with other changes or I want it to be more like the second one and that at least guides us in our next color development. So it's always a good idea to send two versions slightly varying in color when you're doing some color matching to the client, especially if they don't have a specific benchmark product that they want matched exactly. And that way they can then compare and guide you based on comparison feedback between the two samples you send. Remember what I see as more of a red-brown color they may not see as red brown at all. Uh, again, that's why it's good to have a benchmark reference or at least a Pantone color to work to so that you and the concept developer are talking about the same color perception. Again, if you have a benchmark reference, that's one of the best guides because then you can match exactly to that benchmark. So what I have already pre-measured, again, I've measured out my colorants and my base. I'm now going to mix these. Now in this case, uh, I've already predetermined the colorants <clears throat> and I've simply increased um, by around 10% from my previous version. And I've simply done that because I'm creating, like I say, two versions for the client to compare and refer to. I have put a little bit more red in this version. And it gives a good comparison and reference. Best case scenario, they'll sign off on one of these samples. But if they don't, I can at least be guided by what they call red-brown based on these two samples. So I've already added the mica component to this sample. I just need to make sure now that the pigment is thoroughly stirred in. And if I was creating this in a water-based product, I would need to make sure that I'm actually using pre-milled or pre-ground pigments because a water base it's much harder to get the pigment to go into the base formulation or I would need to make much larger samples and use a grinding or homogenizing head on my stirrer to incorporate it into the water based product but because this is silicon based the particles are wetted easily and they go into the base product easily so I can just hand stir Again, just be very thorough, very patient with colour matching to make sure you are grinding and incorporating all the colour. And when all mixed in, make sure you are comparing with a similar amount of product, again going across the arm. I am comparing with dry products, so I will just use a little bit more moist, fresh product so that you can see the difference. Now when comparing these two here, hopefully you can see this has more red in it and it's more of that red-brown shade. Again, it's giving the client to reference and comparison samples so they can select because I don't have a benchmark product to match to. As I've mentioned, I will be showing you colour matching to a benchmark when it's provided in another video, but this one here I just wanted to show you the process in general so that you understand how we create colour match samples. One other thing I will show you before we finish up is documentation. So without showing the full details of this formula you will see that I have written down the base product, the yellow, red, black and mica content that I've added and that's been done for two different base products because I've created two different colours. Now that purposely was not in focus 
because that is confidential information. But I wanted to show you the way we set out the documentation so you can see I have a very accurate record of what I have added even in these very small samples. So again, the next step up from here, if the client was to approve one of these samples, was it would be to prove and confirm the colour amounts used in a much larger sample. So we would go from 10 grams to 100 grams as our next sample. Now that one we don't necessarily send to the client, we compare it to our very small retained benchmark sample. And what we're doing there is simply comparing, uh, we're validating the amount of colour that we're adding in a 10 times larger but still lab batch sample. From 100 grams, we could go to one kilo. You wouldn't want to go a lot larger than that in that next step, again, for accuracy purposes. From one kilo, you could go to 10 kilos, 10 kilos to 50 or 100. With color matching, you need to be very accurate. So again, three digit scales, careful recording of everything you add, and of course, keeping your comparison sample, even if small, it's enough to then compare when you scale up to make sure that your accuracy is retained. I hope you've enjoyed this first video on how to colour match. And again, it's the process that I'm hoping you've seen today. And one of the best things about using basic equipment, it can still be very accurate. You can still get the required result and there's not a lot of cleaning up to do. Happy formulating.